treating him as a common criminal. Do you know why? Because that's how we <laughs> deserve to be treated. Right? <laughs> but God loved us so much, he said, no, I can't see that happening to them. I will not stand to allow that to happen to them. So what does God do? God says, before you and I were ever created, before Adam was ever even started to be formed, God and His Son and the Holy Spirit got together and said, listen, because I give them freedom to choose, if they choose to disobey us, Jesus said, I will take their punishment. And the Father said, that sounds like a good plan. I think that's, that's great. We'll do that. And the Holy Spirit said, yes, I agree. Now see, if you were to ask me that, I would say, Shh, dude, really? That's the best? You're going to sacrifice your son who's perfect. You're God. Why don't you just make something that you can sacrifice? You know what I'm saying? But that didn't work. Because all the intelligent creation that God created failed. Angelic perfection failed with Lucifer. Is that right? Adam fell. Is that right? They couldn't die for you. Angels can't die for you. Who is the only one that can take the penalty for your sin? Someone equal with the law. Someone, and the law is a is a transcription of God's character of who and what He is. The only one that was qualified was Jesus Christ. In the book of Revelation, they give you the symbolism of seven seals. And John sees these seven seals, and no one was qualified to open the seven seals. And John started to weep and to cry because no one was found worthy. And brothers and sisters, that is you and I. We are not worthy. But one comes. And he is worthy, and he's able to open those seals. Who is that one? Jesus. Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one. And he is worthy to open those seals, and in those seals is God's final act of restoration. Amen. Sin and the blight of it will be taken care of. God's people will be sealed in their foreheads. They will be saved, and they will be carried off into Egypt. Okay, so you have this trial. Jesus is found guilty. Pilate interviews him. Pilate gets a letter from his wife. His wife tells him, what? I have nothing to do with this just man. He's caused me a lot of problems in my dreams. Right? Pilate reads it and does what? Gentlemen, don't ignore your lives. Now you're, <laughs> now you're stepping on my coat. <laughs> you better believe Pilate is going to be raised up in, in uh, uh, resurrection. And that's going to be either the second or third thought he's going to have. Man, I should have listened to my wife. <laughs> he asked the people, because he found no guilt in Jesus. Now think about this. Pilate had interviewed hundreds or thousands of criminals. And this one man was different from all of them. They accused him, they accused him, and he said nothing. And Pilate said, are you not going to say anything? Do you not hear everything they say against you? And Jesus kept his mouth shut. Pilate said, don't you know that I have the power to set you free or to crucify you? And Jesus opened his mouth then. And what did Jesus say? You have no power except it's given to you from my Father above. Pilate stepped back, that caught his attention. He stepped back, he looked at him and said, Where are you from? Where's your kingdom from? Jesus said, My kingdom, kingdom is not from this world. <laughs> now, can you imagine what Pilate was thinking? He is up. Man, this guy's a nut. He's safe, he's just a nut. Or he was thinking, What do I have standing in front of me? But listen, something inside of Pilate wanted to set Jesus free. And he tried, right? Oh, yeah. He tried. But listen, this trying to set Jesus free was a proof that the Holy Spirit was working on Pilate's heart. Working on his heart, working on his heart. P 
Pilate had to make the choice to submit to the will of the Spirit and the Father, and Pilate chose not to do that. Pilate was a politician. Pilate went before the people and said, okay, I'm going to let the people make the choice. And he brings Jesus out, and he brings Barabbas out, and he gives him a choice. Who do you want? A criminal who was found guilty, or this man, the king of the Jews, who I find no fault in? And what was the crowd's reaction? Barabbas. Don't you think there are people in that crowd that Jesus actually healed? Cast demons out of? You know that there were some of the 5,000 who ate some of his fish, and then the 4,000 who ate even more of his fish. It's 9,000 people right there, right? Maybe not because some of them may have had been in both places. Well, there's women and children, too. Plus, a lot of them have heard Lazarus. So listen, this, brothers and sisters, is the perfect and most powerful example of what it means to live in the flesh or live in the spirit. Those people who saw Jesus do great miraculous works, who ate the fish that he miraculously got from a kid's lunch, who saw him raise the dead, or at least heard about it, were screaming for them to kill him. When three days before that, they were throwing palm branches down, hailing him as king, Amen. wanting him to take the throne. His mother, the other Mary, his disciples, even though they ran away, they weren't screaming to crucify him, were they? No. They were trying to save his life. Now listen, when they crucified him, where were the women at? They were right at the cross. The women were the closest ones to the cross, right? They weren't afraid. Where were his disciples at? They were afraid. Afar off. Okay? He dies. He's crucified. He pays the debt for your sin and my sin. Supernatural things start to happen after they nail him to this cross and they lift him up. There is a darkness that comes over the land. Now, have any of you ever been to Israel? Okay, it's, it, it is an arid place, is that right? So there's not a lot of trees there that block out the sun. So in the middle of the day, it is bright. But yet this darkness comes, and this darkness was so dark you could feel it. And that darkness, we're told from the spirit of prophecy, was the father shielding his son so that people couldn't see him suffer the agony, the pain, the shame of what he went through. And I want you to visually picture that because that death is what you deserve. That death is what I deserve. I see, brothers and sisters, I've come to this conclusion a long time ago. I know that to be true. I know that's what I deserve. And that's why I continue to follow Jesus Christ. Because what he did for me is he kept me from that kind of punishment. What can I say to God? I owe him this. He has every right to take more than a pound of flesh. I have nothing to give. And all God wants is my heart. And he tells me that if you give me your heart, that is enough. But I don't want 98% of your heart. I don't want 99.5% of your heart. You give me your heart, you give it all to me. That's what it means to be a Christian. So up on the cross, he sees his mother. And he says to his mother, beside him is John. Peter wasn't there because Peter denied him and ran away in his shame and his guilt. Judas wasn't there either because Judas went back through the money and went and hung himself. But John is right there by Mary, and Jesus looks at his mother and looks at John and says, Mother, behold your son, son of the whole son. We have no idea the kind of pain and agony physically that he went through on that cross. But we all have felt pain. We all have felt deep physical pain. Some of us have felt physical and emotional pain at the same time. Jesus went through all of that. 
and that his thought wasn't about his pain. On that cross, in the midst of that suffering, it wasn't just the nails, it wasn't just being beaten, it was the fact that he was taking my sin, paying my debt, but he was still able to look at his mother, and his thoughts were about her care. That's selflessness. That's what God wants you and I to be. That's the transformation. That is the new birth. We can be transformed into the character of Christ. So on the cross, takes care of his mother. He isn't done there because there's two other people that are crucified with him, right? Who are these people? They were thieves, right? Throughout all history, that's what they're known as. You don't know their names, but they are thieves. They deserve it what they got. They deserved to be crucified. Right? Now, those who don't believe in punishing your children, the thieves on a cross, did they deserve to be there? The one, the one thief said to the other one, we deserve to be here. Right? If you do what's wrong, there has to be a punishment for that because we are wicked, sinful people. You cannot just allow bad behavior, which will turn into wicked behavior, which turns into evil, go unpunished. It has to be checked. Parents, you have to do this with your children. Adults, you have to do it with yourselves. All right? We live in a totally different world than the world I grew up in, and it's not for the better. Okay. But both of the thieves were mocking Jesus because in their pain and their agony, they had all of that inside and it was just coming out. For out of the mouth speaks the treasures of the heart. But the one thief looked at Jesus and something changed in him. And he saw his innocence. Now listen. These two thieves, do you think they were two Jewish boys? I think they were. Yeah. Because they weren't Romans, because you couldn't crucify a Roman. Right? So, Barabbas. Barabbas wasn't a Gentile who raised up to come in and free and liberate the Jews. Barabbas was a Jew. These other guys with him were Jews too. So as they grew up, they understood from the teachings of the Old Testament about the Messiah that was to come. And you see, the one thief didn't get it. The other thief saw it the Lamb of God, who was to be slain. And the thief understood what was going on in the temple, and the thief looked at him and said, this is the Messiah. And he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, thou shalt be with me in paradise. I left out that word today. Okay? So there's no confusion. As I close this, Jesus dies on the cross. The Pharisees are thinking, this is it. It's over with. We can move on from here. Our place is protected. But Jesus told them, listen, they're going to kill me, and on the third day, I will what? Rise again. So Friday, they crucify him. The Sabbath comes. Oh, these guys. These guys are, are so close to God that you couldn't have a thief or a criminal hanging on the cross for the Sabbath hours. And he didn't want to break the Sabbath because that would be breaking the law. So they killed their Messiah. He's hanging on the cross, but they didn't know he was dead yet. And they wanted to make sure he was dying or be dead before the Sabbath would come on. Because again, against the law, can't have him hanging up there. So they were going to hasten the death of all three of them. So they send the Romans out. They're going to break their kneecaps. And they come to Jesus and find out he's already dead. Do you know why they break their knees? <laughs> when they crucify you, you're hunched over. Okay? Which depresses your lungs. And to take a breath, you have to actually lean backwards. Now you're on a wooden pole and every time you do that, you're getting splinters in your back. Now, not only that, but they got that nail in this nerve that goes right here. So you have to actually put your weight on your wrist 
and rise up through feet. That's why it's called crucifixion. It's where we get our word excruciating from. Okay? So every time you take a breath, you rise up. Rise up. They break their knees because they couldn't do that, and you would suffocate. You didn't die because they put nails in your hands and feet. You died. Very slow, painful death. And eventually, you just couldn't breathe anymore. Sometimes they lasted for more than a week. And yet Jesus was dead in a matter of a few hours. Why? Because as sin was put upon him and he became our substitute, he paid that penalty and he died the second death. But the story doesn't end there, brothers and sisters. Let's turn back to our Bibles and this is where we'll close. <coughs> Turn to Matthew 28. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, and came and rolled back the stone from the door, and sat on it. And this angel's countenance was like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow, and the guards shook for what? Fear of him. Now listen, these guards that were there, because, isn't it funny how the wicked players in this story remember what Jesus says, but his own disciples forget. They had a guard set there. These are the people from the Sanhedrin, because he said, that this imposter said that he would rise the third day. They knew what he meant. They knew he wasn't talking about destroying that physical temple. They knew he was talking about his body. This is how steep in evil they were. Satan had full control over them. So they had a guard, a Roman guard, set in front of his grave. These were hardened soldiers. And they were not afraid of hardly anything. Battles didn't fear or scare them. But when this angel came down, they fell again and shook and were terrified. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is what? Risen. Brothers and sisters, that is why we have hope. Because he did not stay in the tomb. But because he rose, he gave us a promise that is built on God himself. That if he rose from the dead, we too will rise from the dead. Amen. And if we lay loved ones in the grave, we will see them rise again. But listen, I don't want to die. I want to see Jesus come back. Amen. I want to be one of those people in that last generation that sees him coming back. I want to be faithful to my Lord and my Savior. I don't say that out of my own power because I know that I can't do that. Amen. But I trust him. I trust that what he says, he will do. And he says that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as you leave here today and come back next week, Next week is our Easter program. Next week is all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Don't leave <coughs> here the same person that came in. But leave here changed because Jesus lives in your heart. Amen. Listen, some of us have been Christians for decades. Some of us, our fire has grown very dim. Some of us... We are more concerned with what the people next to us are doing more than what Jesus has already done. Either you love Him and He is supreme, or you're going to live out your life in the flesh. If you live out your life in the flesh, this church will not grow. It will stay as it has been. And that is, we get people who come, then people who leave, people who come, people who leave. What happens is the church has a small period of unity. We love each other, but then we start looking at each other, and then we realize how much we don't like each other. I tell you all this because we, as a church, 
had come from, when I first started, of, of 19 people who would come to worship service to how God is blessed now. Right now, Don and I have talked about this over and over again. The church board has discussed this. We are at 100% capacity for the buildings that are here. There is not one room here in church that's not being used for something. We're at that point where we have to decide where we're going to go here in the future. We either need to move forward. That means moving forward, expanding what we have, building, <coughs> or we're going to stay. And if we stay where we're at and do nothing, we're going to start to decrease in number. I guarantee you that. Okay? People will come in, they'll see that there's not a whole lot of uh, places to sit, and they won't feel comfortable. How many of you don't stay for potluck because there's not enough room in that little room there to actually seat everybody? We have to move forward to do that, though. That's going to require us as a church body to come together in the love that Christ has called us to come together in and not be superficial, not just be lovable Christians on Saturday, but to really love each other for our faults, for our weaknesses, for who we are, and accept each other in Christ and really draw together and build each other up and move forward and build this church and show this neighborhood that what has happened here is from God. That what God is doing is something special here. It's only going to happen if we follow Christ and love each other. Amen? Amen. Amen. The question is, is from here, where do you want to go? Some people like small churches and they don't want to see any type of growth. My one goal from coming here to before I leave is to see the church grow and expand. I'd like to see a building project. What we see here now, like I said, is we don't have enough room to do what we want. And if we continue to get more people coming in, we're going to start running out of room here. Here. We've already run out of room there and everywhere else. Okay. That's going to require commitment. God has a vision. I would like to have a vision that is in align with what God has. We're going to discuss this. We're going to bring this up before a church and business meeting and see what the church body, because you're the highest functioning order in the church to make decisions. And we're going to see where we're going to go from here. Whatever the will of the church is, we see that as the will of God, and we'll move forward, we'll stay the same, or we'll start to decrease. Never stay the same. Never stay the same. Amen. You've seen it. Those of you who've been here long enough, you've seen it. You've seen waves, people come in, and people go. People come in, people go. But I'm going to tell you as a pastor, this is what I see, this is what happens, and we're here right now. People come in, everything runs fine, but then we start to get interpersonal relationship problems inside the church. We're at that point right now. Then people start to leave. Then we build it all up again. The same thing happens. If we don't come together and put aside our petty, and I mean petty differences, if Jesus was willing to go through what he did so that you could live forever, don't you think that we could have a little more compassion for each other? Amen. Amen. I'll close with that. Our closing hymn is number 166. They said I could take one hymnal if I was going to preach. They said I could take one hymnal home. And so I found out of all the hymnals, I found that one. So, so, so I picked this song in a circle, but I personally don't know if you know this. Yeah. 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 166.
Wesley. It's Charles Wesley and others. Charles Wesley and others. Who are the others? That's, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I picked this too, because I look at those things on the top and say, hmm. Charles Wesley probably wrote a couple of the verses, and then the others added to it. Let's bow our heads as we close. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day. Lord, as we get closer and closer to the time that this world celebrates the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Father, I pray that you will once again reignite in our hearts that flame, that burning zeal to show the world that we are Christ and he is ours. Father, I pray that you give us strength, that you give us wisdom, that you give us love in our hearts, that we can move forward from here, that we can truly be ambassadors for Christ. Lord, help us not be just Saturday Christians. But help us to take Jesus in every day, in every aspect of our lives. Amen. Father, we're all faced with choices every day. Help us to choose Christ. Help us to choose the right. And help us, through Christ, to be righteous people. For this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.